Be informed. SMS your name to 0406 UMA. Shakoto ila wakiri su ahibdi. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad Al-Mabuthi rahmatan al-alameen Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi al-tayibin al-tahirin Wa ala kulli ma istanna bi sunnatihi wa tada bi hadihi ila yawm al-deen Wa salama tasliman kathiran thum an ba'd Allahumma la alma lana illa ma alamtana innaka anta al-alim al-hakim Allahumma alimna ma yunfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana Wa ja'alna fi talbi alma laka min al-mukhlusin wa taqabbalhu minna Wa da'afu fi mizani hasanatina innaka anta al-barru al-kareem we begin, inshallah ta'ala, tonight the series of the great scholars of Islam. And the guest of tonight's lesson, inshallah, is an imam that began as an individual, and then he became a sheikh, then he became the imam of a city, and then he became a source of guidance to millions of Muslims around the world and across different centuries. And then he became a figure of Islam, known to Muslims and to non-Muslims. He's a man that began as a student in a school. And then, and then he, rahimahullah, became the imam of that school. And in fact, he became a school himself. To the extent that his name became more famous than the name of his teachers. If you ask about him, you all know him. And if you ask anyone about him, they'll know him. And if you ask them about some of his teachers, they will not know them because his name prevailed over the name of his own teachers. Rahimahullah. He's a man who's kunya is more famous than his first name. And his fiqh, rahimahullah, is more famous than his personality. The guest of tonight's lesson is Imam Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. And inshallah what we'll do, and of course one lesson will not be sufficient to talk about the complete or different aspects of the life of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. So we'll actually highlight uh, some of the uh, areas in his life that are not known to many people and will also highlight some of the areas in his life that we can benefit from and seek guidance in our activities and in actually designing our path in seeking knowledge and even in our treatment or the attitude that the Muslims have towards their religion. Abu Hanifa, whose kunya, whose kunya is more famous than his name, his name is An-Nu'man ibn Thabit ibn al-Marzaban. And this Imam, rahimahullah, he is from a Persian background. As his grandson Ismail mentions, نحن من أبناء فارس الأحرار We are from the free and noble uh, children of Persia. Meaning he's from, an, he's from a Persian background. And his grandfather, Al-Marzaban, in some they say his name is Zuta, and Marzaban is a title for, his, uh, for the first name, for his first name talking about the name of the, of the grandfather of Abu Hanifa. He became Muslim during the reign of Umar and he moved from the city of Kabul, which is today the capital of Afghanistan. He moved down to the city of Kufa and they settled in it generations after generations and therefore Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, was born in the city of Kufa. And he mentions that his father Thabit was taken to Imam Ali عنه, when he was a child, when he was young. And he made dua for him to bless, for Allah to bless him and to bless his offspring. And that's why some of the ulama they say that Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, was part of the answer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the dua of Ali ibn Abi Talib to Thabit that was sent to him when he was young. He was the only child of his parents. And he was born in a rich uh, family. 
And people have differed, historians have differed in relation to whether his grandfather has ever been enslaved or was not enslaved. There is a khilaf in relation to this, which I don't think it makes much of a difference because his studies, rahimahullah, uh, uh, really ever looks or actually overwhelms any other khilaf in relation to the, to the issue of freedom early in the life of his grandfather, rahimahullah. Imam Abu Hanifa, he was not like other ulama who were born into the circles of knowledge. He used to work with his father. His father was a merchant. He used to sell, uh, he used to sell textiles and silk and such uh, materials. And he, to, and he took the trade of, of his father and he carried on with that. And the ulama, they say that the only thing that is significant about his childhood, rahimahullah, is the fact that he memorized the Quran at a very young age, which was a tradition that the children used to go through back at this particular period of time. However, they say that what changed the attitude of Imam and what put him into the, into the path or on the path of Ilm was a small incident that happened to him when he was young. They say that Ash-Shabi, rahimahullah, one of the scholars of the Tabi'een, was sitting in front of his house and he used to see Abu Hanifa all the time when he, was, when he was young. So one day Abu Hanifa was walking past him and then he called him, he said, come. So he came to him. And he asked him, Where do you usually go? And his intention was, Where do you usually go to seek knowledge? So Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, said to him, I'm going to Fulan. I'm going to that businessman, to that merchant. You know, I have to get something from him or I have to deliver something to him. And then he said to him, that's not what I'm asking you about. I'm asking you about where do you go, to which circles of knowledge do you actually go to? And then I said to him, I don't. I don't really go to circles of knowledge. Sometimes I do, but I usually don't. And then Ash-Shabi rahimahullah said to him, my son, I advise you to go to them. For verily I see in you signs of nabaha and fitna. Signs of intelligence. Okay. So I believe, I advise you to actually start seeking knowledge and start attending such circles. And this simple advice that I was given by Shabi rahimahullah, he was himself from the uh, known scholars of the Tabi'een, of course indicates two, two points. I don't want to analyze too much because uh, time is upon us. Indicates two points. First of all, that Shabi, he was observing Abu Hanifa over a period of time. And he saw, so this, this advice of Shabir rahimahullah indicates that he has been observing the behavior of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah in the market for a while. And that's why when he saw him, when he saw his intelligence, and that's why even they say that he rahimahullah, he was from a young age gifted with debates. You know, when he talks, he's someone that has a very persuasive power. And they say as a result, that's why Shabi rahimahullah, he gave him that particular, uh, that particular advice. So he said, from that moment, I began to pay attention to the circles of alim, to the circles of knowledge. And then Abu Hanifa rahimahullah had to choose, what kind of alim am I going to seek? What do I begin with? And the main directions or the main disciplines of study back then in Sharia were one of three. Either you study Fiqh and what relates to it, or you study Hadith and Riwayah, or you study Philosophy and Theology. These were the three main areas that people used to focus on. So here, Rahimahullah, he chose an area that is appraised, that is liked, by the people around, and that needs a lot of skills. At the same time, it's an area that is highly controversial. And therefore he chose to begin with theology and philosophy. And this area is still controversial until today, and is still popular until today. So here, rahimahullah, began with it, and he began to go to the city of Basra, that was somewhat known to be the capital of theology and philosophy, where 
many different sects existed and many prominent scholars of different sects existed in it. And he began to seek Alm al Kalam and the, uh, uh, and the style and the uh, uh, principles of uh, dialogue and debates. And he says, Rahimahullah, I spent a couple of years doing that. And I entered the city of Basra more than 27 times. In each visit, sometimes in each visit, I will sit in the Basra for a year. And sometimes I will sit for a couple of months. Until I learned everything that relates to this. Uh, as they say in Arabic, يعني ختمها. And he learned from A to Z. That's it. He's done. He finished all of it. And he said, I debated everyone. Because I debated the Khawarij, I debated the Mu'tazila, I debated the Ibadiyya, I, I debated the Shia, I debated different sects of the Shia, the Kisaniya. He debated everyone. Until he reached a level where he believed that there is nothing else that can be added to his knowledge. And of course, he debated atheists and different types of atheists, rahimahullah. And Abu Hanifa, take this for any from now, he has never been defeated in a debate. He, rahimahullah, was not defeated in a debate. All these people, they argue against him, they fall. Given a bit of time, they fall. And then, once he felt that he reached such a stage, he actually went back to the Kufa, and he began his own circle, which is his right, in the Masjid of the Kufa, in the main Masjid of the city of the Kufa. Kufa is in Iraq, and Basra as well is uh, in Iraq. So he said, I returned, and I opened up my own circle, and people and he beca began to, 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 learn, to learn from him. And he spent, and this happened during his teenage years, before 22. Of course, 22 is significant in his life as well. So, he said, so I sat in my circle and I began to teach people. And that was the first phase in his life. Until another incident happened in his life, again, that shifted the direction of Abu Hanifa completely to another area. And the ulama, they mentioned two aspects that caused that shift. And that shift was for him to change from someone that teaches theology and philosophy, and he is the best in it, in the Basra and in the Kufa, to someone that begins again as a student studying fiqh under a particular person. And from a scholar to what? Student again. What caused it? Zufar, he mentions uh, the, the practical incident that happened, and then Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he mentions what happened inside his heart and his mind after a while. Zufar, he mentions that Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, was sitting in the circle, and he had his students around him, and then a lady, an old lady, entered, and she asked him a fiqh question. She said to him, if someone uh, if a man wants to divorce his wife, a sunni talaq. A sunni talaq. How does he do so? Abu Hanifa, what did he study? Philosophy. Philosophy and theology. So he did not know the answer. Next to him, there was a respectable and also another famous scholar of the Tabi'in. His name is Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. And he used to teach fiqh. So I said to her, go to this man, ask him the question and come back to me. So she went, she asked him and she came back. I said, what did he tell you? He said to me that he waits until she becomes clean from her cycle and then he divorces her during that, during that period before he actually has any sexual intercourse with her and that will, become, that will be a, a sunni talaq. I said to her, okay. She left, he rahimahullah took his shoes, he dismissed his class and he went and sat in the circle of Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. And he changed from being a sheikh that is known in a particular discipline to again being a student in the circle of Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. And then he, rahimahullah, he says why. Of course, that incident, you can say it is the trigger that offloaded what Imam Abu Hanifa had in his mind. He said, I spent a number of years for my life in the area of theology and philosophy. 
But after a while, I stopped and I thought about it a bit. And I began to reflect on it. And I said, were not the Tabi'een and the Sahaba more knowledgeable than us in these two areas and the controversial issues of Aqidah and, and philosophy? He said they were. He said, but despite the fact that they were more knowledgeable and more skillful than us in them, they never entered into them. They never spoke about them. They never debated about them. They never thought about them. What they did, they used to prohibit people from delving into such areas. He says, but at the same time, I noticed that they used to enter into the area of fiqh and sharia. And they opened up schools and they accepted students. And they used to debate fiercely against one another. So I thought to myself, why should I spend my years in learning something that the Salaf did not spend their time in learning? And that was what made him, rahimahullah. And then the incident of the woman came, and the incident of the woman was the, you know, the small push that he, rahimahullah, needed so he can make that, uh, make that move. And from that point, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, will not be involved in debates unless someone provokes him to enter into debates. And in fact, his son Hamad, whom he named after his main teacher, Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman, we're going to come to that. Once he began to debate, and then his uh, father, Abu Hanifa, he heard him. And then he said to him, my son, I don't want you to debate. I don't want you to debate anyone in the area of philosophy and theology. And then he used to say that to his close students. And Abu Hanifa was not a tyrant. In the way he deals with his students, he was not a tyrant. He's someone that he can speak to and he speaks back. So Hamad said to him, and a bit of a, a daring word. He said to him, you used to debate in this. And now you tell us not to debate in it. Is it halal for you and haram for us? Then he, rahimahullah, said beautiful words. That I mentioned the story because of them. He said to his son, he said to him, when we used to debate, we used to face our opponents in a manner as if birds are sitting on our heads. And when there's a bird on your head, what do you do? Do you move around a lot? You focus. Scared that our opponents will make a mistake. He goes, but when you are debating, because he can see, you are waiting for your opponents to make mistakes. And you are waiting for them to make mistakes so you can actually nearly declare them as kuffar. Because you're waiting for the mistakes. Oh, you made a mistake, catch him. There's a team. So our attitude is different than your attitude. And then from that day, his son Hamad, rahimahullah, who became a jurist in fiqh, by the way, and he, he carried in the footsteps of his father. And then from that, his son never entered into uh, the area of debates in theology and philosophy. And him, rahimahullah, unless someone would uh, uh, provoke him. And we're going to come to some, to some examples of that. Yani, when I look at this story, I reflect and I think, if a person like Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, with the knowledge, with the brilliance, with the intelligence, with the scholarship that he possessed in that particular area after learning it from the scholars of it from the different sects in his life, he reached a stage where he stopped on it. Why would we, in our life, in our youth days, waste our time in such areas where scholars like him knew that there's no benefit of it or therefore they closed the door? It. Something that I want you to think of a bit. Because that shift granted us as Muslims one of the most important figures that is responsible for the guidance of millions of people across different centuries. Rahimahullah. Had he not entered into fiqh, much of his knowledge would have been lost. Much of his times would have been lost. And that's why they say, Ali, he was actually the effect or the result of the da'wah of Ali ibn Abi Talib when he made to his uh, uh, father rahimahullah. 
Therefore, he became a student of Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman. And Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, when he began learning from Hamad fiqh, he was 22 years old. He was 22 years old. So he started a bit late in comparison to uh, his time. But they say that he was a best or the best student that someone can have. He was in love with Hamad to the extent that he named his son after him. Not only that, he stayed with Hamad for 18 years. Now Hamad is only one of his teachers. Okay, we're going to come back to, to his teachers inshallah. For 18 years, didn't leave his circle. Didn't think of starting his own circle until 10 years went past. And he tells us about this. He says, after 10 years of my life being passed as a student with Hamad, نَزَعَتْنِي نَفْسِ الرِّئَاسَةِ you know, you know, I start thinking, you know, I should now become a leader. You know. Alhamdulillah, I'm good in fiqh. So one night I said, tomorrow, when I go, خلص, I'm not going to sit in the circle of Hamad, I'm going to sit by myself, and I'm going to have my own circle. And that was his intention. He slept, he woke up, he went, and he said, as, as subhanAllah, look at the love. He goes, and as I entered the masjid, and when I, in my eyes, saw him, rahimahullah, meaning Hamad, my heart could not let me move away from him. So I sat with him in the circle again. And I couldn't do it. He wanted, but he couldn't do it. After 10 years of learning with him. He goes, but by the qadr of Allah, one of the relatives of Hamad died in the city of Basra. So he had to travel. So he placed me in his, in his post. He said, Oh Hanifa, you are responsible for the lessons until I come back. And he was absent for two months. Hamad was absent for two months. He said in these two months, I had 60 different cases that were presented to me, which I, were able, uh, uh, which I was able to uh, resolve 40 of them. And 20 of them I couldn't. So I left him until Hamad came back. After Hamad returned, I presented all the cases to him, including the 20, the 20 that I did not know the answer. And then he, rahimahullah, gave me the answer for all of them and he approved the 40 that I passed. And then he taught me what I should have said in relation to the other 20. So I said to myself, there's no point of leaving Hamad. And I stayed with him until he died. And therefore, in, in, uh, in addition to the 10 years that he spent, eight years were added to that. That's why Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he began teaching at the age of 40. He became a teacher at the age of what? 40. Alhamdulillah today, yani, within our 20s we become a shaykh. <laughs> he began teaching when he was at the age of 40. And he, rahimahullah, was very much in love with Hamad. To the extent that he became his servant, he used to be his servant. He used to go and wait by the door of the house of Hamad before the time of the salah. And then he would go with him and accompany him to the, to the salah. And Atika, the sister of Hamad, she says, I can only, and when I think of Abu Hanifa, I can only think of him as the one that used to take care of our cotton. Not for cotton, al cotton. When, when, the, when the cotton they clot, you have to break them apart. Yeah, that's something from the Middle East. He's one that used to be responsible for maintaining, any for the maintenance of our pillows, and he's the one that used to bring us the milk, and he's the one that used to bring us the groceries. That's how much he loved Hamad. And he says, I sit in my house and I will not dare to stretch my legs in the direction of the bed of Hamad out of respect to him. Despite the fact that between my house and the house of Hamad there are seven streets. There are seven streets. But his adab with his sheikh, rahimahullah, he will not feel that he actually can stretch his feet in the direction of the house of Hamad. That's from the love that he had for his sheikh, rahimahullah. And he says, and when people used to come to me and ask me, of course there are reasons for that, because Hamad himself was, and was a special figure as well. Uh, yes, and he said, when people used to come and ask me questions about fiqh, I will answer them, and then I will pause, and he will give them an answer, and then he say, wait. And then I'll go to my teacher Hamad, 
And I will ask him, Fulan asked such and such, what should we say to them? I said such and such, what should we say? And then he will wait for the approval of his sheikh to the word that he said. And then whether the words of Hamad agree with what he has said, or did not agree with what he has said, he would go back to them and he will say to them, Hamad said, one, two, three. So therefore he, rahimahullah, of course, and he, he began teaching at the age of 40 years old, then therefore you're talking about a man that reached maturity. It's easy for someone when he's young to be a student. Because you're young and, and your teacher is older than you. But it's not easy for someone to be mature and old and, 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 uh, and intelligent and brilliant and a scholar in a particular field, then become totally a submissive student to someone else. But here, rahimahullah, from the humbleness that he had in his personality, he was able to reach that level. And therefore, he will get back to them and he will say, Hamad said uh, such and such. Was he his only teacher? No. He had actually uh, hundreds of teachers. And in fact, he had thousands of, uh, uh, of, of teachers. Some narrations say they had 4,000 teachers. Allah alam. That's a bit of, a, of an exaggeration in relation to that. But definitely he had hundreds of, uh, of teachers across different fields in the area of Sharia. After the death of Hamad, the people began to thought, began to think, the, any of the students, who is the one that should replace him? They thought of different names. They'll put him and they'll, they'll not be able to stand. The son of Hamad, rahimahullah, was a scholar but he was more specialized in grammar and in Arabic then he was with Fiqh and then the eyes directed towards who? towards Abu Hanifa rahimahullah and then he from then took the post of his teacher Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman however Abu Hanifa he founded a completely different style of teaching a style that was not used at his time and from there you can see the evolution that he rahimahullah caused in the area of Islamic uh, 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 Sharia his style was not that people will do what we're doing. He speaks and people listen. His style was teaching through discussion. Therefore, he will sit with his students around him and then they'll bring up a particular issue. A particular issue in fiqh, in, in salah, in siyam, whatever, in any other area of the sharia. And then they'll begin to discuss it, the students. And then they will debate with one another. And here, rahimahullah, is sitting amongst them. And each one will bring a proof to what they're saying. And they will argue about it until sometimes the voices will, get, will actually will, will become high. And they will become loud in the argument. And he will not say a word. He will not say a word until they finish everything that they have to say in relation to the matter. And they argue or they discuss with one another until let's see, there's nothing else to be, to be said. Each one of them has forwarded his analogy and his proofs in relation to what the ruling should be. Then, here Rahimahullah would speak. And he'll go through what they have mentioned. He will analyze it and he will talk about it. And after he does that, he will look at them and he will say, do you agree? And ones that agree, Tuthbat al-Mas'ala, Abu Yusuf will actually write the ruling in relation to this particular issue. That's how he used to teach, rahimahullah. So he can see, and one of the things that amazes me in the style of Abu Hanifa, other than the fact that no one else has used it in his time, is that he developed in his students from a very young stage, from a very early stage, the ability to debate, and to discuss, and to think about counter-arguments. To make sure that the argument or the, or the proofs that they have are firm and fixed. And that's why Abu Yusuf and sometimes we will spend months talking about one masala. We'll spend months talking about one masala. And once one of his students, once and they were arguing, face discussion. And then Abu Hanifa wanted to speak. As soon as he wanted to speak, Everyone became silent. And by the way, students of Abu Hanifa were scholars of their time. Were themselves scholars of their time. And they were not just amateurs, no. They were people that had well founded in other areas. He had muhaddithin like Waqia, who was one of his students. Abdullah bin Mubarak, Yusuf, Muhammad bin Hassan, a lot of people, Zufar. A lot of them. 
So one of his students, he looked and he noticed and he said, Ya Aba Hanifa, Subhana man ansata lak al jamia. He said to him, glorified is the one that made everyone silent when you speak. Because once he used to speak, rahimahullah, none of his students will raise his voice until he finishes what he has to say. And he, rahimahullah, whenever he used to get stuck, and one of his students was al Fadl ibn Ayyad, and he, one of the uh, famous figures of, uh, uh, of Salah and Zuhd and Ibadah, he stuck. And when he used to get stuck in a particular mas'ala, and he will, he will think, but he cannot reach a conclusion in relation to it. He would say, I'm not able to reach a conclusion to it because of a sin that I have committed. And then he will begin to make istighfar. And then they will say that if it doesn't get resolved, then he will get up and he will pray to rakat to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in repentance. And when he returns and he sits and he gets an answer to it, he will say, Arju anna Allah qad ta'ba'ali. Okay, I hope that Allah has forgiven me the sin that I have done and that's why he has provided me with the answer to the issue. Al-Fudail ibn Ayyad, he was an example until today mentioned in the area of ibadah and zuhud and so on and so forth. When he heard these words from Abu Hanifa, he began to cry. Al-Fudail. And he said, Abu Hanifa only said this because his sins are little. Because his sins are little. And not a lot of people are aware of that fact. Meaning, not a lot of people, Allah will allow them to know that their sins can be a hindrance in the path to death. So that was from the signs of his, uh, uh, of his piety and closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, he used to look after his students. Today students look after the sheikh. Back at this stage, Abu Hanifa, He's the one that used to like to look after his uh, students. And he used to pay for them, and he used to fund them. Because Abu Hanifa was born in a wealthy family. Once Abu Yusuf, as I mentioned, and Abu Yusuf is known, he's actually one of the imma of, 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 the, of the madhab, of Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah. He says, at an early stage in my life when I was studying with Abu Hanifa, my father said to me, oh my son, don't sit with him. Don't sit with him. Why? He said to him, he's a man that his bread is baked. What does that mean? He's rich. He's rich. He doesn't have to go and look for things and, you know, and work. He's, everything is ready for him. But we're not. Go out and work and help me out myself. So Abu Yusuf, what did he do? He stopped attending the lessons and he began to work with his father. Abu Hanifa missed him. Where's Abu Yusuf? Why is he not coming to the lesson? So he came one day. He looked at him and said to him, okay, I want to see you after the lesson. He said, yes. He finished the lesson, he said, why aren't you attending? He said to him, I'm not attending because my father told me not to attend. You know, I have to work, I have to help my family, I have to help uh, my parents. One of said to him, okay. And then he gave him 100 dirham. He gave him 100 dirham. And he said to him, take this and spend it on your family. And when you run out of money, Come back to me and I'll give you its equal. Abu Yusuf mentions a beautiful fact. He says, Wallah, ad, yani, as soon as the money ends, he will give me without me asking. As if someone tells him that my money has run out. That's why Abu Yusuf he says that Abu Hanifa spent on me and my family 10 years. Just for the sake of seeking knowledge. And it's not something that Ali has done with, with Abu Yusuf, he's done that also with Al Hassan ibn Ziyad. Al Hassan ibn Ziyad, also one of his students, uh, uh, he, was, and he was in a family where the majority of them were actually girls. He was the only son in the family. So again, his parents said to him, Listen, you are the only uh, uh, male in the family, you have to go out and work. It's not expected that we're going to let your sisters work. You have to go out and work. So he did the same. Abu Hanifa heard, then he, gave, he made an allowance for him as well. I said to him, you take this allowance and you give it to your parents, you give it to your dad, and then be scared, inshallah, those who learn fiqh will never become poor. Those who learn fiqh will never become poor. And he will fund them, rahimahullah. He will fund his students to make sure that they sit and they learn. Why? Because of his love to Ali. Because he wanted to spread it. And that's why the historians, they say that Abu Hanifa spent the majority of the wealth of his, of his father, of his, uh, 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 of his family 
on knowledge and seeking knowledge and teaching people. And he himself, rahimahullah, continued to work, continued to work uh, uh, in, uh, in trading, in selling and buying textiles. I'll mention a few things about him because I'm already running out of time. Uh, he, rahimahullah, was unique. Why? Because of four things they say about him. In the market, Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, was a man that deals with sale and purchase with a rich soul. What does it mean with a rich soul? Meaning, he does not sell and buy because he feels that he needs money. He was content with what he has. So he didn't have the urge that I have to win, I have to win, I have to gain, I have to gain in everything he does. Second, they said, he, they said that he was extremely trustworthy in his dealings. We're going to come to examples of that. Third, they say that he was very God-fearing because he was very, very strict in his worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore the implications of this used to be evident in his transactions. And fourth, they say that he was tolerant in his sale and his purchase. What does that mean? And if only he wants someone to buy from him a piece of silk, he wants to sell it for 100, the guy says 95, he says 95. He's buying from someone, he says, I'll give you 100, he goes, go on 105, we'll give him 105. He was easy. As the Rasul has, 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 has praised the man to be in his dealings. He wasn't stingy. That's why they say that Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, was a stranger in the market of the Kufa. You will not find someone else like him in the way that he used to do. Once from his amana, listen to this. From this amana, once a woman came to him, she had a piece of textile. Said to him, I want to sell this. How much would you? Uh, and I want $100 for it. 100 dirham for it. He said to her, no, it's worth more. He said to her, 200. He said to her, no, it's worth more. She said, 300. He said, no, it's worth more. He said, 400. He said, no, it's worth more. He said to him, are you making fun of me? She, be she became angry with him. She <laughs> became angry with him. And they said to her, don't trust me, ask someone else. He said to her, on the 400, it is worth more. The man that valued it, he said, this is worth 500. And he bought it from her for 500. Today, if we can squeeze them, we'll squeeze them. <laughs> Until there's nothing else left in them. Look at his amana. How much is this worth? Did not lie. Eh, it's worth $2. It makes money, money eight, money five hundred. No, it's worth five hundred, and he borrowed from her on that, on that price. And he used to be easy with those who are poor, old, weak, woman. Once a woman came to him, said to him, "I'm poor." He trusted her word. She said to him, "I'm poor. Sell me, and I need a piece of material, a piece of, a piece of clothing. Sell me something at Scott's price." He looked, he looked, and he said, "Take this for four dirham. Yeah, four, four dollars." Again, she became angry. <laughs> <laughs> You're making fun of me? Is your cost person is for, for, uh, for dirham? He said, no. But I bought this with another piece of material. And I already sold it and made profit on it. But I deducted the cost of this from the profit of what? Of the other one. And there's only four left. And he gave it for four dirham. And he used to have, because he was busy with knowledge, he had a, a, a partner. His name is Hafs. He was responsible for the sale. So he, all his time is away. Second knowledge, he will just come to settle account. Sometimes, every now and then, he'll come and check on him. But most of the time, he's learning. He's learning. Once they bought uh, 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 stock, one of the pieces of material in the stock had a, has a flaw in it. So before he left, he said, Hafs, be careful when you sell this particular piece of material, make sure that you tell the customer that it's got a flaw in it. It has a tear in it or it's worn or something. You know? There's something small wrong with it. So they make sure you tell him that before you sell it. He said, yes. So Abu Hanifa went, he came back at the end of the day. They're settling the accounts of, of, of the sale. He said to him, Hafs, you sold that piece of material? He said, yes, I sold it. He said, did you tell the customer that there is a flaw in it? He said to him, Allah, I forgot. So Hafs said, Abu Hanifa, he refused to take the intake of the, of the, of the store on that day. And he gave it all out in sadaqah. And he said, he shocked me because the intake of that day's sale, the sale of that particular day was 30,000 dirham. 
And he, rahimahullah, refused to take a cent of it. And he spent all of it in sadaqah. Just because of his amana, rahimahullah. And they say, there's a lot to be said about him. I'll, we'll take glimpses from different areas. And they say that he used to refuse to take the allowance of the rulers. The Mansur came to him. Or actually, the Mansur called him to him. He became angry with him. Back then, the, 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 the rulers will actually used to make allowances for the, uh, for the scholars. Said to him, why are you refusing our allowance? So you had rulers back then that even if you don't take the money, they get angry. So I said to him, why are you refusing my allowance? Because he knew that Abu Hanifa was not very happy with him. Then he said to him, he said to him, he goes, why are you refusing to take my gift? Listen, Abu Hanifa said to him, I have not received any gift from you. And I would not refuse your gift if I get it off you. But what has been sent to me is something from the public Muslim money. And not anything from your money. And I am not a mujahid. And therefore I have a, I have a right of allowance in it. And I am the de I'm not the dependent of anyone that is fighting for the sake of Allah. And therefore I have no right in it. And I am not from the poor Muslims. And therefore I have no right in it. And therefore I don't take anything from this because it is not. I have no, no right in it. So very politely he said to him, you're not giving me from your own wealth. You're giving me from the wealth of the Muslims. And that was... One of the slaps that the Mansur suffered from him. That's why Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, he had a very bad relationship with the rulers. They were not very happy with him for a number of reasons. That's one of the examples. Another example of the Mansur, once he had argued with his wife, and he said to her, and he, and he, and he was telling his wife that I want to marry someone else other than you. And polygamy is halal, and you know, the, the, the common uh, conversation that takes place between husband and wife. He became angry, he said, I want to marry someone else. He said, no, you don't marry someone else. He goes, all right, put a judge between me and you. Shut Abu Hanifa. Allah. Poor Abu Hanifa was brought from his house to judge between the Mansur and his wife. Yeah, Abu Hanifa, come. He came, he said, uh, uh, do I have a right to marry more than, more than one? He said, yes, of course. And then he mentioned the ayat and the proofs. Mansur became happy. He said, see, I told you. And Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said to him, but that's only in the case when you can be just. And if you cannot be just, then you have only right to one. Subhanallah, by the way, the Mansur is the one, al Dhabi rahimahullah, he says the Mansur is the one that played a primary role in the death of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. We're going to come, we're going, we're going to, come to, to, to that. He played a primary role in the death of Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Again, there's an indication that, that to the Mansur that you're not someone that is just. In general, so the Mansur became solid. And Abu Hanifa walked out and he left. And he would not visit them unless they asked for him to come. And he would avoid being around these governors and these leaders. So the wife of the Mansur sent him gifts, silk and, uh, you know, and a horse, a couple of things she sent him. So he returned the gifts to her. And said to her, the words that I said, well, I, when I said them, were not for your sake, I was only defending my religion. So take back your gifts. The Mansur was the Khalifa from the Abbasi, from the Abbasi Khilafah. Before him, the Umayyads were the ones that were ruling. They placed a man on the Kufa, his name is Ibn Hubayra. This is an important story that is to be, to be mentioned. Ibn Hubayra, they, they gave him the Persia responsible for the Kufa. Of course, also Abu Hanifa was not happy with the Mawiyin, with the rulers. When he came Ibn Hubayra, he called all the jurists of the scholars of the city, and he gave different people amongst them different roles. Judges. Diff different administrative and managerial roles. And he decided to give his seal, the seal of the government, to Abu Hanifa. What does that mean? That means that any decree gets issued from the office of the premier, similar to the premier today, the one that signs in it and seals it is who? Abu Hanifa rahimahullah. Abu Hanifa said no. The other jurists at his time, rahimahullah, they said to him, Abu Hanifa, we're all being forced into this. I mean, we, don't, we, don't, we don't like the positions that we have. So be easy and accept it. 
and we all accepted what we don't like about what we do not. You too, do like us. He said a beautiful statement. He said, Wallah, if he asks me, if he just asked me to count the doors of the masjid of Wasat, I will refuse. Any? One, two, three, four. He goes, I will refuse. How about me putting my signature on a paper when he decrees for someone to be killed without right? He goes, by well, Allah, I will never do this. He goes, if, the, if, the, if this man asks me to count the doors of the mosque, the mosque, I will not accept. How about when he gives that decision, and this decision is not correct, and he says, Fulan to be killed, you want me to sign on it? Wallah, I will not. And he said no, and as a result, he, rahimahullah, was in prison, and he was bashed for that. And he was whipped for this 110 lashes. Over the course of 10 days, until the one that is responsible for torturing Abu Hanifa came to Ibn Hubayra and he said to him, you gave me a dead man. You gave me a dead man. What does that mean? Meaning he's saying to him, this man is a man that will not say yes until he dies. He's not breaking. I'm, I'm, I'm. And, that's, and they used to whip him on his, all, all his body and on his head and on his face, rahimahullah. And he was steadfast and he would refuse. So the one who's responsible for torturing him, he himself felt sorry for him. He went back to the brother and said, listen, there's no point of what we're doing to this man. This man is not changing. This is a dead man. If I keep on bashing him, he will die and he will not accept. Go and find someone that can speak to him so they can soften his mind. And Abu Hanifa heard about this. And yes, before that, he, rahimahullah, endured the torture until they bashed his face. Until the lashes of the whip began to take and ate from his face and his face became swollen. That's when he, rahimahullah, began to cry. So they said to him, Abu Hanifa, you endured all this pain. Why now are you crying? He goes, Allah, because I'm not crying because only pain, but I'm crying because I know that if my mom sees my face, she'll be upset. And I'm upset because my mom will be upset because of me. SubhanAllah, rahimahullah. So he heard, and they said to him, we're going to send someone to consult, to consult to speak to you. He said, listen, let me, let me think about it. So they released him. Once they released him here, rahimahullah, we say, we say today, he jumped in the car and he left. He jumped on a horse or a camel, and he took off from the Kufa, and he ran to Mecca. Abu Hanifa ran from accepting a post. And today people kill each other to reach a particular post. Because they don't want to sign on a paper that can have in it any oppression against any Muslim. His mother, when she saw him, she began to cry because she saw his, way, his face being injured. So she said to him, my son, why are you seeking a knowledge that will cause you such suffering? As a mother, she's soft. She's not thinking with her, with her brain. She said to her, oh, my mom, if I wanted the dunya, I would have gained it through that knowledge, but I want the akhirah with Allah. And that's why I sought this particular knowledge. And here, rahimahullah, he hid in Mecca for six years. He hid in Mecca for six years and had not returned to the Kufa until Ibn, Ibn Hubayra uh, uh, was, uh, the whole Khilafah was overtaken by the Abbasin and Ibn Hubayra was removed. He hid in the Kufa just because he did not want to become someone that signs the papers of the, of the ruler, rahimahullah. And that's why they used to hate him. Even those they used to work, they used to hate him. One of them, his name is Rabia. He said, once he entered on the Mansur, now the Abbasi one, and he said, this is the day when I will actually kill Abu Hanifa. So he entered. As the sinning, he said, Ya Mansur, Ya Amir al muminin Yes. Mansur is from the offspring of who? Of Abdullah ibn Abbas. He said to him, this man is a man that opposes your, uh, 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 your grand grandfather, Abdullah ibn Abbas. He says that he was wrong in his fatwa in relation to the Amin. Now, Abdullah ibn Abbas used to say, if you say, I swear by Allah, I will not do this. Even if after a period of time that elapses, you say, accept such and such, you make an exception of it, he used to pass that, he used to allow that. Abu Hanifa used to think that this is not, this is not, this is not acceptable. So Rabia, he thought, that's good, now I can, I can catch him. He's a man that is saying that your grand-grandfather, the great, Khali the great Sahabi, Abdullah ibn Abbas, is wrong. He believes if someone reverses his oath after some time, 
this is something that is not allowed. So Mansour became angry. As if he has a right <laughs> to become angry. He said to him, did you say that? Are you opposing the fatwa of my, of my uh, grand grandfather? Abu Hanifa looked at him, look, now we see his skills and debates. He looked at him and he said, Rabia is saying that no one has any pledge to you. Rabia is saying that no one has any pledge of allegiance to you. So Masul looked at him and said to him, how is he saying that? He said, because if we are to accept that, then anyone that comes to you and says, I pledge that I accept you as the Khalifa, then by the fatwa of Abdullah Nas, he can go back home and says, no, I reverse it. <laughs> so everyone that gave you a pledge, he can go back on it. What do you think, Mansour? Not a word. <laughs> Not a word. So Rabia became angry. He said to him, you nearly killed me. You want to kill me, Abu Hanifa? He said, no, you wanted to kill me. So what I did, I saved my blood and your blood. I saved my blood and your blood. Another man called Abu Jafar Tusi, he did this, something similar. He entered and the sitting and he wanted to corner Abu Hanifa. You can't corner him, Rahimahullah. Imam Malik, Rahimahullah, he says, he says to them, Abu Hanifa is a man that if he wants to convince you that these pillars that are made of stone are made of wood, he can. Imam Malik, Rahimahullah. So Abu Jafar said, Oh, Abu Hanifa, you are the most knowledgeable person of the Kufa. Yes. Sometimes the Amir Mu'mineen asks me to kill someone. Should I obey or should I disobey? What does he want to do? Again, he wants him to say words so he can actually be executed. So Abu Hanifa smiled at him and said to him, does the Amir ask you to do the haqq or does he ask you to do the batil? <laughs> and that's the answer now. Abu <laughs> Jafar. He says the haqq. He said to him, if you ask you to do the haqq, then do the haqq. <laughs> and he walked out with his students, rahimahullah, and I said, he wanted to chain me, so I chained him. He wanted to chain me, then I chained him, rahimahullah. And I'm running out of time. I'll just mention two things, inshallah ta'ala, and I'll conclude with that. He was very, he was a man that was very silent, does not speak a lot. You can sit with him for a long period of time, and you will not hear his word. That's why Jafar, he says, I accompany him for six months. Wallah, and one lesson is not sufficient to speak about him. He goes, I accompany him for six months. And he will not speak. He goes, except when someone asks him about fiqh, he becomes like a gushing river that has a momentum of voice, a loud voice. And he's quiet. Once you ask him, he becomes to speak, and mashallah, the knowledge that he gives, it becomes like a gushing river. He finishes, he's quiet, alhamdulillah. I will not say anything after that. And they used to say, وَعَمِيقُ التَّفَكُّرُ he, he used to contemplate a lot. That's why Yazid, he mentions that one day, the Imam was praying the Aisha, and he read in the Aisha, Surah Zalzalah. Then we all finished the Salah, and looked at Abu Hanifa, and I saw him sitting, and breathing heavily. Breathing heavily, meaning, he's very affected by what? By the Ayah, Rahimah. By the Surah So I made the light dim because back then there were no lamps and I went. Yes, it was one responsible for the for the masjid. He goes, I came back at the time of Fajr. And also him sitting in the same spot where he was, repeating the last ayah and Surah Zazir. Repeating the, the same and he did not notice the time. When he saw Yazid, he said to him, Are you coming to turn off the light? So tell me, Abu Hanifa, it's time of Fajr. So I said to him, Uktumani, please don't tell anyone about what you saw from me, rahimahullah. And that's why they say he prayed uh, Fajr with the wudu of Aisha for 40 years. And those who doubted 40 years, they confirmed that he did that for 30 years. Rahimahullah. One more thing. Last thing. Second last thing. Once he was talking in a group of people, and he said, Al-Hassan al-Basri is wrong in this particular mas'ala. Hassan Basri was, you know Hassan Basri was famous. He's wrong in that particular masala. One of the attendees, he said to him, you son of a prostitute, you are calling Al-Hassan wrong? Like this to Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa did not say a word to him. He said to him, I'm only saying that he's wrong and Abdullah Masoud is right. 
And when another man, Rahimahullah, spoke to him, and the, and the argument got intense between them, he called him, he goes, Ya Mubtada, Ya Zindiq. He began to just, when he gets him, you are an innovator, you are misguided. And he began to call him names. So Abu Hanifa looked at him, he goes to him, Wa Allah, Allah knows that I don't have any of the traits that you have mentioned to me. And he knows that since I have known him, I have not paid attention to anyone besides him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the man, when he heard, this vo when heard his words, subhanAllah, his anger became diffused, and then he said to him, please, uh, Imam, forgive me for the words that I said. He's calling him Zandiq, heretic, and Mubtadi'ah. He became affected by it because he can't see himself like that. He goes, well, Allah knows that. And he began to cry, He goes, Allah knows that. I, was, I, I had never known, I had never had anyone in my heart. From the day I knew Allah, no one else has entered my heart besides him. Meaning, I will not accept or tolerate anyone else besides what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likes. That's why, and I'll conclude with this, the Mansur, when he came and said to him, I want you to be the judge. Said to him, no, I will not be a judge. That was in you know, the last stage of his life, He died 150 Hijri. Said to him, okay, don't be a judge. I want you to be the judge over the judges. And he basically supervised the jurists. He said, no. <laughs> he said to him, why? He said to him, Wallah, I don't trust myself. When I am, when I am pleased, how can I trust myself when I'm angry? And he said to him, Wallah, if you drown me in the river of the Furat, I will not accept. He said to him, are you, are you saying that you're not fit for it? He said, yes, I'm saying that I'm not fit for it. He said to him, you're a liar. You are fit for it. It goes, you ruled against yourself. If, you are, if I am truthful, then I am truthful, and therefore I'm not fit for it. And if I'm a liar, then I'm a liar. And how could you place a liar, a, a liar as a jurist? So Al-Mansur imprisoned him, Rahimahullah. And they bashed him. <laughs> Allah, it's amazing when you hear these words about it. I bashed him to become a ruler, to become a judge. He refused. And then they actually began to put him on a hunger strike. They will not give him food. They'll let him starve. They will starve him. He, Rahimahullah, refused. And then they say he could not convince him. And some people from the scholars came and respected Mansur of Mansur. This is Abu Hanifa. You know, if he dies here, people are going to kill you. <laughs> so he let him go. They say, Dhabi Rahimullah, he says, and he poisoned his food. When he let him go, he put poison for himself, for, for Abu Hanifa and his food. That's why they say, after, and he banned him from giving fatwa. He said, you're allowed to give fatwa. The least of his, all the problems of, of the Imam, Rahimahullah. So he released him, and they say he poisoned him, and then shortly after that, he, rahimahullah, died. And some they say that he died in a state of sujood, may Allah have mercy upon him. And that's why they actually accused the Mansur of killing Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah, and he would not be the first ruler to kill such a pious person. Of course, I skipped a lot about his life. I know I took uh, a bit of your time, so inshallah ta'ala, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make us of those who listen to the words of Allah and to his teachings and they learn from it and practice it. I ask Allah to bestow his mercy upon Abu Hanifa rahimahullah and to put him in the, in the company of the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallahu alayhi sallam Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Jazakum anna khair.